Let's talk about each of them in their detail and some of their characteristics. So remember, we were interested in a global identification system in which there were several attributes. Uniqueness, globally, is one of them. The others that I haven't really talked about are enumerated here as well. For a spreadsheet, uniqueness is not guaranteed, for sure. It's something to use within that spreadsheet. And here's our example from Moses yesterday, where his photo number is a column in the spreadsheet and that is an identifier. The other important thing is that we're going to share our information on the web. We would like for our identifiers to be able to take us somewhere and tell us something about the object that they describe. For example, a URL. A URL, you put it in your browser and it opens a page or it downloads a file. It does something. It's active. It's resolvable. That's what it means to be resolvable. The identifier does something when you go out on the web. The next important aspect is persistence. That is to say, how long will that identifier maintain its functionality? That's important because if I use, in this spreadsheet, if I use a number, as I said, number 10, how long will that work for Moses? He might be able to keep that number 10 for that photo forever, or he might not when he discovers that there he has other photos that would be called number 10 given his naming scheme. At that point, he might have to change these IDs because of the context, in which case the persistence goes away, it's not guaranteed. Or, if he continues to manage his data in Excel and highlights this column and sorts it, and forgets to sort the column next to it, then it's completely been lost. Its persistence has completely been lost because the photo numbers are disconnected from what they're supposed to be connected to. So it's really at risk in an Excel spreadsheet. Final category of characteristics is one of your ability to create that identifier yourself. In an Excel spreadsheet, no problem. You can put the identifier in yourself. By that, I mean you can generate it at the source, the source being you. So I want to look at these characteristics for all the categories that I showed you in the previous slide, namely all of those categories. We'll look at them all. If we go to a primary key, here's a little snapshot of our final product yesterday in which we had two tables, one that was based on occurrences, one based on photos. And the occurrence ID in the occurrence table was a primary key in a database. In this case, uniqueness is guaranteed. The database will not allow me to create two of the same occurrence IDs in that table, but only within this table. So it's guaranteed locally, but not globally. That's the critical difference on the first day that I was telling you between a spreadsheet and a database. It's not resolvable on the web. If you remember when we created this table, we were inserting numbers between one and 293. You put one into your browser, it doesn't get you to that occurrence. So it's not resolvable. The persistence is guaranteed within this database management system. If I go to this table and I try to change an ID, it will tell me, sorry, you constructed me and warned me that you might try this. I'm here to tell you, you're not allowed. You told me not to let you do that. So persistence is guaranteed in the database. That's a good thing. So there are a couple of good characteristics of a primary key in a database. The third one is you can generate them yourselves. We did that yesterday. So three out of four, not too bad. Well, two and a half out of four, because it's not guaranteed to be globally unique. The next kind of identifier to discuss is a UUID, a universally unique identifier. An example of that is down here. It's a big, long string of characters. UUIDs are always of this form and always that long. They're exactly that big. 
and they always have this form with a dash exactly in those places. These are generated randomly. And you might ask yourself, if they're generated <laughs> randomly, how do you guarantee that they're unique? And the answer is, you don't actually guarantee that they're unique. But the random generation of these numbers creates a space of numbers so vast that if the entire population of the world created 600 million of them each, there'd be a 50-50 chance of creating a duplicate. So for practical terms, these are unique. The chances that you and I create one that is the same is less than zero in terms of reality. So they are, we'll call them guaranteed globally. But you put that into a web browser, it doesn't take you to the object that that identifies, so it's not resolvable. Persistence is guaranteed. That number is always going to, uh, well, it depends on the context, actually. If you put that in your database and then write over it, it's not persistent. But in terms of the world at large, this scheme of um, global unique identifiers does have persistence. You can generate these yourself. You might ask, how? You tell me that it's created randomly, how do I make one of those? I'll show you that it's quite easy in a minute. Then the universal resource name is something of this form. It's the one that I was showing you earlier on. So when I showed you this before, it was actually an LSID or there was one, there was an LSID that looked like this. But this is a URN. It starts with the word URN and it has the form of strings of characters in between colons. Okay? But it, that also is not resolvable on the web. Its persistence is guaranteed in the way that a UUID is consistent, uh, is persistent, and you can generate these yourself. But again, no resolvability. It's also not globally guaranteed to be unique if there are two collections that happen to have the same institution code. Suppose that there's another FMNH out there that's not the Field Museum, and they have a mammal collection, and they have a catalog number that's that big. Then there could be a duplicate there. Town has a question? Just a comment. In the late 1990s, that refers to the Field Museum of Natural History. The Florida Museum of Natural History started using FMNH, and they do have a mammal collection. Yeah. So there's a, a possibility for collisions there, just because the, the social problem of identifying the institutions has not been solved. This is where the, um, the index of collections, like the index or barriorum, solve that problem for you. You have to be registered there. Your acronym has to be registered, and it's guaranteed not to collide with somebody else's acronym. Now, a life sci sciences identifier, I can show you an example of one here and another here. These are URNs also, but they differ in URNs in that they are specialized URNs. They're specialized in that they have this potential to be resolvable. They are resolvable if there's a resolver out there on the web that can do it. So to show you how that works, here I have just a raw URN. I could use this as an identifier put it in my database. I can't resolve it the way it is, but if I send that URN to a resolver like this one, to that web address, that web address will take that, turn it into a link like this that will take me to a resource on the web. If I have an internet connection, I can convince you of that. First, let me look just at the resolver. So if I just look at the resolver, it takes me to a web page that says, put an LSID in here, and I'll go find it for you. 
which is functionally the same as if I click on this, it's going to take the LSID through the resolver. The resolver is going to go find it and fi give me the web page back that corresponds to it. And it does. It says, this is, you're looking at a specimen record for this thing here. The details can be seen at that link through Discover Life. And I found out all kinds of information there. I can find out further information about it by clicking on this. So the URN, going through a resolver, has taken me to a location on the web corresponding to that resource. So a life science identifier is a system in which it makes URNs resolvable. Okay? Nothing more than that. This is the one that many of you have seen because DOIs or digital object identifiers are attached to journal articles. They're used universally to identify journal articles and other publications. And the form that they take is the letter D, follow DOI colon and then some string. Now these strings don't have any meaning to humans unless you always publish in that journal. In that case, this number means something to you, but it's unlikely that it means something to you. That identifier all on its own does not resolve on the web unless you have a special tool in your browser or if you send the URI, so, sorry, if you send the identifier to a different resolver. In this case, it's a DOI resolver. So, uniqueness is guaranteed globally for DOIs because somebody else generates them. They're generated centrally. So they're never gonna create two of the same. You're guaranteed of that. And it has the potential to be resolved because there exists out there this service this organization that's dedicated to resolving DOIs. There's more than one of them. And the reason they can do that is because they sell DOIs. That's how they support the system. I don't know what the cost of a single DOI is, but it, there is a cost to it. So if I buy a million of them, you can assure yourself that it will be more than a dollar. <laughs> okay. Persistence is guaranteed. They generate it centrally and they're going to keep it. The persistence is guaranteed insofar as DOI's infrastructure continues to exist. So DOI is more robust than an LSID because it has an actual sustainability model, of an economic model behind it. You pay to use it. An LSID is free but there's no guarantee that the resolvers will continue to exist because somebody has it on their server and they're paying for it and when they can't pay for it anymore, it's going to go away. DOIs have a huge impact in the world of literature and so they're likely to be supported. But there's a cost to it. And it's interesting because it uses a resolver also. We could use DOIs for specimens. They're no reason that they have to be for journal articles. Then we come to URLs, which we all know and love. They're unique, interestingly, their uniqueness is guaranteed globally. You put in a URL, it goes to only one place, by definition. They cannot conflict. They are potentially resolvable on the web. You ask, why are they only potentially resolvable? That's because I can create one and I can put it on my own web server, on my own machine, in my own university.